to another episode of the Dark Rum Podcast, the show where we talk about all the things that creep in the night. I'm Kyle. I'm Turtle. I'm Kyle. And I'm Turtle. <laughs> today's episode, <laughs> On today's today's episode, episode is, is brought unoffic- to you by Pennsylvania. Yeah, unofficial Pennsylvania episode. Pennsylvania. The glorious state of Pennsylvania. William Penn State of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Pennsylvania, where people go to lose their dreams. Where people from New Jersey and New York go when they can't pay their bills anymore. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. <laughs> Full of hillbillies and hicks and then people that think they're a city. Uh, yeah, that's actually... There's like two two or three major places. Technically, we're in one of them. Yeah. And Bon Jovi and Bruce Springsteen wrote songs about it. Yeah, <laughs> you all right, Slugger? Uh, yeah, we're in we're in the Lehigh Valley. The Valley of Lee. The, Le- the Valley of Lee. And then there's also Pittsburgh. That's about... That's about what's in- yeah. oh, I guess just Philadelphia those. Philadelphia is not a real place. Oh, Nobody Philadelphia cares. is, you know, Reading's not a major city or anything. Uh, Reading definitely doesn't count. No, actually, it's not. We're top three. Yeah, even though technically the Lehigh Valley counts as a whole thing, we get counted with the cities. Well, because the Lehigh Valley is a conglomeration. This is unnecessary. <laughs> but speaking of our general area, let's talk about Centralia, Pennsylvania. <gasps> Centralia. Centralia. Uh, so tell me about Centralia, t- 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 Tucker, Kyle. Kyle Tucker. Kyle Tucker. People have already turned off the show. <laughs> All right. All right so, so, so tell me about Centralia, uh, Kyle. We're going to get deep in this because I have an unnecessarily large amount of notes. All right. So in 1749, Native Americans sold the land that now makes up Centralia to colonial agents for the sum of 500 pounds. That's heavy. 500 pounds of what? I don't know. Monies. Oh, they, wow. How Five, much is 500 pounds of dollars? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure this is before American dollars, considering so, 1776 so, so is Brit- when America became America. So British pounds we're talking about. British pounds. Okay. Fat British people. One fat British no, man. No, that's 500 not. 500 pounds. I mean, although slavery was a thing, I doubt that's what they were actually selling, because that'll be only like two people, and that's not really a. Also, if they sold one 500 pound man, that'd be the worst slave ever. How much work is he going to do? I mean, that's actually a good point. Like, what is he, <laughs> what is the 500 pound man going to do for you? Dude, you get out there, you're like, I'm you tired. Can't milk be like, him. You just walked there. Be like, yeah, I'm going to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 1770 settlers began to survey and explore the land. This was during the time of the construction of the Reading Road, which stretched from Reading to Fort August. When did you become a historical yeah. book? Um, when I let other people help me with my notes. Wow. Could you maybe spice it up a little bit? Yeah, You're don't worry. When you start. I got it. I got it. 1793 Revolutionary <laughs> War hero Robert Morris, who also signed the Declaration of Independence, acquired a third of Centralia's Val- Valley's land. Do you know why we call it a John Hancock? This is related to Declaration of Independence. Because it was so big. Yeah, but do you know why? Because it was the size of John Hancock's cock. No. No. That's nope. how big he wrote his name. Because King George was Yo. blind as a bat. So John Hancock, knowing he was blind, signed it super large as a big fuck you to King George. That's why we call it the John Hancock. We're not going into this much history. That's Philadelphia history. That's just a funny... That's that's the whole thing. I'm already shorter than your history report. Go on. So why did she do this here? (laughs) Why didn't you proofread her to cut stuff out? No, I'm fine with that. It's the way it's written on this page. I have to scroll to the side. No, I missed Kyle, why are you doing this? Okay. This is Vanta Black all over again. No, okay, fine. All right. <laughs> you don't want to know the history of Centralia? No, no, I do, but you know, the, like this let's is get the, the backstory before it became a ghost. Oh, town. No one cares about the backstory. We only want to know about when the whole town burst into flame. Amanda's gonna be so sad she took so many notes for me. <laughs> this episode's brought to you by Amanda. I love Amanda, but don't let her take notes for you anymore. In ni- eighteen sixty two, Centralia mine. Coal mine. Pretty sure it was a Centralia coal mine. That's all the notes. Says. Anyway, <laughs> so but she got dates and when it was founded and how many people they sold to buy it. 1856, the first two mines opened: the Locust Run Mine and the Coal Ridge Mine. Anyway, Centralia is a coal mining town. Pennsylvania Pennsylvania's is big. On this coal. area and that area, Berks County, are big coal mining areas. Let me skip ahead since Ryan's getting bored. Yep. 
1866, Centralia was incorporated as a borough with its principal employer, the anthracite coal industry. Do you know that's something that's weird around here? Um, there's a lot of towns that are incorporated, not established or like founded. So like um, Palmerton is incorporated because of the zinc companies. Centralia was incorporated because of the coal mines. They started as businesses that they then added, like they made them as a company into towns, probably for tax purposes or something. I don't nah, know. it's for cowboy stuff. But also that led to a whole bunch of shit recently with Centralia. Okay. And like modern times because there's a whole conspiracy about it with uh -huh. the government trying to like, the fires are not happening, but the government actually staged this so that they could shut the town down so that they can then legally claim the rights over the coal mines of Centralia. But because it's incorporated, so it would just go back to the state. But it's incorporated, so wouldn't it go back to the corporation? No, because the corporations are gone. Um, oh, so it becomes public domain. 1980, Centralia had 1,012 residents. Wow, that's so tiny. I know. Um, that was like less than my high school. Jesus Christ, this is so many notes. This is thrilling. I'm so interested. Please, Kyle, tell me more about Fine. Centralia. Fine, we'll skip all the stuff that you think is boring. Or bitch. What is happening? Don't tell him to... Don't encourage him to push me. People no, want to know the history of Centralia. He was telling me I need to be closer to the microphone. Anyway, in 1950, Centralia Council acquires the rights to all anthracite coal beneath Centralia through a state law that was passed in 1949. So therefore, the town owns the coal mines. That's why. Okay. Okay, so the town now owns coal mines. Yeah. Centralia had its own school district with an elementary school, high school, and a Catholic <sighs> practical school for its 1,012 member. Yeah? Slugger? <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. We'll get to the part that you freaking care about. So, as many people might know, Centralia is on fire. And yes. it's been on fire for a long since time. Since May 27, 1962. That, see, that's an important date. That's the only date you've said so far I give anything near a shit about. What? <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> you're like, man, I want to learn about these killers, but like, don't tell me about their birth. I don't want to What does that. it matter? Just start giving if, me if numbers the of things they killed. is a Sagittarius, guess what? I don't care. Some people do. Some people are weird. <sighs> So, okay, important date. Say that again. When was the town burst 1962. Into flame? So, 1962. So, slightly older than my mom. The town caught fire. The mines caught fire. All right. So, David Decock, who wrote Fire Underground, the ongoing tragedy of Centralia Mine Fire, believes it started with an attempt to clean up the town landfill. This is what I always heard. I didn't know that there was controversy over this and that there's many stories to how the town caught on fire. Okay, so I don't know any. I just heard. You don't like, know any of how it did? No, no. I heard like a dude like threw a match and like set the fucking no, mine on fire. No, they, the government or smoking, did it. Yeah, something like that. Oh, the government did it. You heard smoking? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't even what? think that's on my list, so we'll just have to talk about that. Yeah, then, like I'm, this is where I'm. Okay, I'm, you got me. I'm interested now. What I heard was this one. So the Central Borough Council <laughs> hires five members of the volunteer fire company to clean up a town. Ironic. Like <laughs> which is located <laughs> in an abandoned strip mine pit next to the old fellows cemetery mm -hmm. previously the landfill was located near a different location and was cleaned up uh, before mm -hmm. like they've done this before yeah and so what had happened was like they assumed that this pit that they were in was completely stripped of coal and then they set the fire and the trash to burn and they were wrong yeah and it was still full of coal <laughs> and it's still full of coal and they're and still not sure how much coal is there because it, well, they're it, pretty it, sure at least spread. 200 more years worth. Well, it spread. That was the, the yeah. issue. Well, that's because there's like hundreds of mines. And because of like uh, like pirate mining, like yeah. people would just go and illegally mine coal there. Uh, there's more tunnels than people even know about. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what the issue is. I heard scientifically. <laughs> I could be totally fucking wrong, too. Uh, I heard that the because there were so many intricate tunnels and specifically because of the pirate mining. There's all these air vents, so when the fire spread, it heated up enough that normally coal just wouldn't burn through all of the ground because there's not enough oxygen to... No, but there's so many openings there. But there's so many comes openings of air And at this point, the ground's cracked so much well, yeah, that you can get it, in there. The initial burn cracked so much. I mean, I've been there. The <laughs> roads have these massive like, fissures. fissures in them. There's holes everywhere where it's collapsed. You know, One of the reasons you can't drive there... Because your car won't stay? Is because... Well, it's because... 
as the coal burns away, it loses structure and then it caves in and then more air is exposed and it just keeps going. All right, then. So, as I said, May 27, 1962, the firefighters set the dump on fire and let it burn for some time, just as they had done previous times. However, unlike the previous time, the fire was not fully extinguished, and an unsealed opening in the pit allowed the fire to enter the labyrinth of abandoned coal mines beneath Centralia. So, yeah, we're yeah. not just seeing. Yep. But that was with sources, and I just said something that I was told as a child. Yeah. So you, you have the official... You've heard the official That's the still. official one. That's yeah. what I heard. Okay. I think I watched a documentary, and See, that's why. I, I never heard about the landfill part. I think I watched a bunch of documentaries or read stuff about it because of its connection to Silent Hill movies. Well, that's why most people know about it. So if those of us that don't know, Centralia is what Silent Hill was based off of. No, the movie for Silent Hill is based off. The video games are based well, off yeah, something else. Well, yeah, there's something totally different, but the movie was based off of Centralia. And Charlie. we'll find out later, the fact that the church is still there, and like there's some cursed things and stuff. It, it relates a lot more to the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Other sources disagree, though, and believe the fire started the previous day when I lost my place. A trash hauler dumped hot ash or coal discarded from coal burners in the open trash pit. It is noted the borough council minutes from June 4th, 1962. Extra notes that you don't want to know about. Yep. Referred to two fires at the dump and that the five firefighters submitted bills for fighting the fire at the landfill area. By law, the borough was responsible for installing fire-resistant clay barriers between each layer of the landfill, but fell behind schedule, leaving barriers incomplete. Okay. So it still blames the town. The town's still so, at fault, so and that's that someone, one. Someone done fucked up and didn't do what they someone were supposed to. Someone done fucked up and did some bureaucratic stuff to save money. Wait, wait. You're telling me politicians would ever cut corners? No. They care about our safety. I don't know. This sounds legit. No, I don't know. I feel like that's a lie. Another theory is that the Bast Colliery Fire... What the, what the fuck? What are you saying? I don't know. This guy's name is Bast. Bast Colliery. Six minutes. The Bast Colliery Fire of 1932 was never fully extinguished. Oh, so this one's saying that there's just a fire going indefinitely. I mean... Since already. Yeah. And that that fire reached the landfill by 1962. However, a miner by the name of Frank... Jurgils Sr. disputes that theory. He claims, now this is one of those dudes that had a bootleg mine. He yeah. claims he operated a bootleg mine with his brother uh, near the landfill from 1960-1962. So if the Bast, Bast Colliery fire had not been extinguished, they would have been overcome and killed by noxious gases and like heat and flames. So and he stuff. was someone that was directly involved. And even though he was doing something illegal, it was like, hey. He was like, nah, that other fire, yeah. that, that, that wasn't here. I don't know. It sounds to me like, like that second one like of bureaucracy? like bureaucracy kind of fucked up and then tried to pin it on guys that probably did their job just fine. Well, I mean, it could be a mix of that one and the first one because I mean, it could be the both. second one is also saying that some dude was just like, I'm going to throw this hot coal just in this garbage pile, I guess. I mean, and it could have been a bunch of things. I mean, that'd be like going to like a dry forest and being like, I really should probably just put my cigarette out and. That pile of that's hay. A, that's a nice uh, pile <laughs> of hay you have in this barn. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a bad life choice on that man's part. Yeah. Statewide attention to the fire began to increase, culminating in 1981. <laughs> this is what, 30 years? Wait, hold on. Did so I miss something? That's, All right, uh, let's, let's do this one from 1972 force. Okay. Oh, did I say the Bass Calorie Fire was in 1932? So if that's true, then the fire was already burning for, for like 30, 30 years, years before this fire started? I don't normally say bullshit, except that this fire's still been going for the last, like... And it's predicted to go 200 more, yeah. at least right now, because they're not sure how many more pockets it'll hit before yeah. that happens. It was supposed to go out, like, last year or something, and then it hit another pocket. Mm -hmm. In 1979, locals became aware of the scale of the problem when a gas station owner, mind you, is... Almost 20 years later. You said 19, 1982? 1979. Okay, the 1982, so, I accidentally skipped ahead. So this is so we're 18, at 18 years later. 18 years later, the locals are later. just now becoming aware of the scale of the problem. So you're telling me this they're public officials. This has been on fire for 18 years. They're like, told no Whoa. one for no, no, 17 no. Everybody years. knew. They weren't really aware it was a problem. Oh, so they, hey, the ground's Remember, on fire. Remember, that was a town council right. meeting. That stuff is from town council meeting notes oh, in 1962. Wow. So they really were just like, they ground's told on everybody, fire, but it's okay. Well, I mean, to this day, those the people that live there are like, nah, we're good. <laughs> There's anyway, some specials. It became of scale when the gas station owner, the mayor, John <laughs> Coddington, 
inserted a dipstick into one of his... I like the word dipstick. His underground tank to check the fuel... Whoa. To check the fuel levels. Um, and when he withdrew it, it seemed hot. He lowered a thermometer into the tank on a string and was shocked to discover that the temperature of the gasoline in the tank was 172 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh boy. That's, that's, that's real boom dangerous. Boom temps. Yeah. That's, no, that's, that's combustion pretty, yeah. closeness. Yeah. I mean, it probably, he is. probably saw 172 and went time to leave. Yeah. I need to move my gas station. <clears throat> Statewide attention to the fire began to increase culminating in 1981. So now we're, we're 20 ish. 19 years. 19 years or later. 21. Yeah, 19. 19 like years that. later, when a 12 year old named Todd Dumbowski fell into a sinkhole. Ooh, that sucks. Four feet wide by 150 feet deep. Jesus. The suddenly opened beneath his feet in a backyard, his cousin, 14 year old Eric Wolfgang. Wow, this is old because they're putting children's names that are like underage yeah. in the information. Pulled Dumbowski. Out of the hole. All oh, these names are amazing. And saved his life. Wow. He the pulled plume, him out of a 150 foot hole. I, I'm assuming he got him before he went all the way down. Or he dropped feet. rope. I mean, sinkholes don't are you aren't usually perfect. Voids I don't think either. the kid made it to the bottom because the plume of hot steam billowing from the hole was tested and found to contain lethal lows, uh, lethal levels of carbon monoxide. Yeah, so he probably I think didn't he go that slipped far. and was like, oh, oh yeah, his friend got him or <laughs> cousin got him because okay. he probably would have not been alive afterwards. Yeah, no, not he not survived. after a 150 foot drop. Although there was physical evidence of the fire, residents of Centralia were bitterly divided on the question of whether or not the fire posed a direct threat to the town. Wow, this sounds eerily familiar to today. You comparing an underground coal fire to COVID? Uh, yes, yes I am. In the real disaster. <laughs> <laughs> in the real disaster above ground, Steve Kroll Smith and Steve Koch, Coach, Coke, Couch, is it K-O-C-H? No, it's C-O-U-C-H. It's Couch. Cooch. Steve Couch. Identify. Couche. Maybe it's Couchy. Couchon. <laughs> Identified at least six community groups, each organized. Uh, each organized. Each. I need to do my Are verbal okay? warm-ups before each episode. Yeah. Each organized around varying interpretations of the amount of and kind of risk posed by the fire. You know, it does kind of sound like the yeah, government. Yeah, oh man, like, it's, it's a, a little dangerous. Debate. It's a lot of dangerous. It's kind of dangerous. I don't think it's and dangerous. And look, it killed that guy, or it might have almost killed this kid, but you know, that's like a small percentage. We shouldn't really be worried about it. All right, now 20 years later, in 1983, the U.S. Congress allocated more than $42 million for relocation efforts. Nearly all the residents accepted the government's buyout. More than 1,000 people moved out of town. And around 50, 500 structures were, uh, around 500, yeah, around 500 structures were demolished. By 1990, that's what, 30 years now. Yeah. The census recorded 63 remaining residents. Now the town is still on fire. Yep. It's 30 years later. Yep. And there's at least 63 people that are like, nah, it's fine. That sounds super it's, accurate to It's today. fine. This reminds me of like that picture of like the dog that's in like a house that's and burning house is, and he's just like, it's, it's fine. fine. Yep. It's fine. In 1992, Pennsylvania Governor Bob Casey, I remember when he was governor. Yeah, I do too, actually. <laughs> so, this thing that was 30-something years before we were born yep. was taking care of a governor who we now, we remember from being alive during. Yeah. In 1992, uh, he invoked eminent domain on all the property in the borough, condemning all the buildings within a uh, subsequent legal effort by residents to overturn the action. Again, people are fighting to stay in this in town, burning town. A town that's also, don't forget, on fire and spewing noxious fumes. Because that's creating a thing. sinkholes. There's a lot of sinkholes and there's a lot of pockets of poisonous gas. Well, I mean, it's just building up. In yeah. There. Uh, anyway, their, their, their actions to overturn that failed. In 2002... Now, how many years later from this? 40 I mean, now? Yeah, 40 years later. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service discontinued Central A's zip code. It took 40 years of the government going, you're not a town anymore, for them to finally be like, see? Yeah. We proved it. Yep. You're not a town anymore. Yeah. Only 16 homes were still standing in 2006, which was reduced to 11 in 2009 when Governor Ed Rendell 
began the formal eviction of the remaining Centralian residents. Okay, so when I was there was probably around 2009. Only five homes remained in 2010. Yeah. That's, I was around, I, last time I visited was probably around that 2009, 2010, something like that. Maybe a little later. It's still on a list of things that I need to go do because it's nearby. That and that, um, that, uh, he just zoomed in and it freaked me out. I was watching it happen. The, uh, the, the albino town. Oh, yeah. Where they chase you out mm-hmm. or whatever. I feel like that one's not real, but yeah, I've always wondered. Uh, a few homes remaining, rain standing in Central. Most abandoned buildings have been demolished by the Columbia County Re- Redevelopment Authority hmm. or reclaimed by nature. At a casual glance, the area now appears now appears to be a field with many paved streets running through it. That's that's probably pretty accurate from how I've seen it. The sad thing is, though, now I'll never be able to see. The uh, uh, graffiti highway, like you were able to, because yeah. they covered it recently. Did they really? Like the, uh, last year or something like that, they covered it up with cement. Oh, I had no idea. Uh, well, oh no, it was actually more recent than that because it happened because uh, too many people during this time of quarantine got bored and have been visiting Centralia more because they have nothing to do. God, there can't There's possibly actually been... be some type of story that relates to everything going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's recently picked up a lot of tourists in this dangerous town. I mean, um, I guess during a pandemic, sure, go to someplace abandoned. That kind of makes sense. Anyway, sorry. Right, so we'll, other we'll, than the fact that it's on fire, the town's on fire. We'll we'll get past that now. Mm-hmm. It's basically a ghost town now. It's yep. like one of the coolest ones because it's, it's all it's even and less scary. of a ghost town because there's no more houses there's no I more i think road. there's still like seven people that live there though yeah, like okay, the so mayor there's... does they still have all right um there's a church there where is that in the notes amanda was super pumped about that but you can still go to church there every week That's there's a church there super weird people from outside the town come there to have uh to go there. but the thing about super the, weird i don't remember the name of the church and i don't care it's is it church. a cult what do you mean, like the one from Silent Hill? Yeah, well, I mean, oh, I mean, that's yeah, what that I movie is. It's a I town even, that's on fire and a church I, that like claims that like whatever. I didn't even put that together, but yeah, what like why would you go to church in a town in a that's town on, fire? on fire and collapsing into the ground? I don't know. If you're like Baptist, though, you're like, see, we're all gonna burn. Oh yeah, probably. Um, where's the story about the priest that was all like, the town is cursed? That was my favorite one. I meant to open it with this. Did I? Did she not? She didn't. She's just not in here. And you're fine. Whatever. Anyway, there was like another rumor um, that the town uh, made a deal with the devil or something to like get more like profit out of their coal or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, the local priest was like, "You guys, uh, I curse you!" And blah blah blah. The only thing that'll be left standing is this church and all that noise. And then you know the town caught on fire. That's it. I've never heard that. That's interesting. That's that a they, pretty cool legend. I wish like I knew sold, it, or I wish he knew where it was. Like they sold the town soul, yeah, to, to the, the devil. devil for like money, and the preacher like cursed them. Fosty and deals are like my favorite kind of devil stories to listen to. That is that is pretty interesting. I've never heard that. <clears throat> so she did find a couple of ghost stories. We'll also talk about the ghost stories you say you had. All right. So I'll just tell these couple of ghost story accounts that she found. Um... All right. Oh, well, no, yeah, all right. Never mind. Here, pop culture. Then we'll bring up the parts about how it's in that movie that we've mentioned like 14 times. Yeah. So Centralia has been used as a model for many different fictional ghost towns and manifestations of hell because it's hell on earth there. Yeah. Um, prominent examples include Dane Koontz, Strange Highways. D- Dean Koontz? Dean Koontz, Strange Highways. What did I say? You said Dane. Yeah. That guy's cool as shit. And Dane David, Koontz. David Wellington's Vampire Zero, which I didn't hear about that one, but I, I know Dean Koontz. Everybody knows Dean Koontz. Um, you know, he say that, but you said his name wrong. Well, he's like uh, not Stephen King, Stephen King. Screenwriter Roger Avery. I keep making that noise now, and I can't help it. He's going to hate that later. He's going to be like, I got to figure out how to do this without fucking up the words. Screenwriter. Uh, Roger Avery researched Centralia while working on the screenplay for Silent Hill, the film adaptation. What? Silent Hill? When did we hear that? I don't know. We didn't say that 47 times. It was a great video game that scared the crap out of me as a child, and movies that then scared the crap out of me as a child, so then I made my children watch it. You're a monster. It was great. I have not seen the sequel to that movie, and I... I I didn't even know there was a sequel. There is, and it looks terrible, and it's supposed to be the little girl grown up, but I thought the end of the movie was like, nah, they're, they're there forever. Yeah. 
you know, when people are like, they try, they hard end something and then they decide they want to do a sequel. Yeah. In 1982, PBS documentary Centralia Mindfire contains interviews with residents and relates the stories of the Mindfire. That's probably one of the ones I watched when I was mm-hmm. younger. In uh, the film, the 1987 film Made in USA opens in Centralia and the surrounding coal region of Pennsylvania. The two summary. Do you know that you can hear the souls of people that have died in the town when you put your head to the past the asphalt? Nobody died in town because the government made them leave. That's what the government's hiding. No money's in town anymore. Well, dead because they're all dead. Duh. Anyway, so it's been in a bunch of things. American History Comedy Podcast, The Dollop, also featured an episode. Now we can be on that list too. Mm-hmm. Um, so is Centralia haunted? Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. Anyway, we found. <laughs> Here's Here some all. stories uh, that of other people said of ghosts that they've seen there. We found a slide covered hillside with steam coming out of it. Yep. And we're pretty fascinated by some fossils we found. Fossils? We what heard, are these, archaeologists? I don't know. When we heard what sounded like a voice saying something inaudible. That's the wind from down below where we were. That's gases escaping from the ground, probably. That's what the screams are. All three of us heard it. We figured it was something else checking out the area, too. Gases. So we sort of ignored it. Gases escaping the ground. Then we heard it a little again. A little more clearly. Probably for another 200 years. A few words. It sort of sounded like, leave this place. Or also, <laughs> There's a story posted on the bulletin board a few years ago of Ruth Ederson who visited in the fall of 1998. Ruth and her friends swore they saw a couple of people walking out of the smoke who appeared to be wearing mining helmets. (laughs) I don't know what you did over there. It freaked me out. The two figures walked up to the large substantial substance hole behind the graveyard and dematerialized like the smoke rising out of the same hole. No, wait, seriously, you found this story? Did you hear that story? No, this is exactly what happened to me. You saw a miner disappear? I saw a dude in an old style mining like overalls and helmet, I swear to God. And we were by the graveyard. That's where I went when we went to Centralia. We went, the only place really standing that we could go was the graveyard. And we were these, you know, I was in college. We were like, oh, yeah, we're going to go to the graveyard. We're going to so touch cool. some ghosts. Yeah. And we saw a dude in mining gear walk behind the graveyard. And then like when we like, because it's like kind of like on a slope. When we crested it, there was no one there. There was nothing. Well, I wonder, because there's all these bootleg mining operations there, right? Maybe they're still mining. Well, no. Maybe they were mining when the fire happened, oh, and we shit. wouldn't. nobody would know about it. Yeah, because they were pirating. Yeah, so, so like there'd just be like someone who's like, oh, no, my husband's gone. He does that from time to time. Also, yeah. maybe the mine collapsed, but I can't say anything because I don't know if I'll get in trouble. If he's even from that town. I mean, if they're pirate miners, they could have been coming from out of town. So no one even knows them. They're going in mining and trucking it out. And all these people died because the literal ground caught on fire around them. Yeah. And pumped it full of noxious gases. That and could stuff. make sense. Because, I mean, yeah. there's no actual stories from when the fire happened of anybody really dying. There's well, a yeah. bunch of near misses. Well, that's why I know I, mean, I heard of other near misses besides that little boy. Mm-hmm. But, like, I also think the government probably made sure it kind of got underplayed because they what? took decades to do anything what? about it. <laughs> Literally Dude, decades. It only took 30 years for them to shut the whole thing down. A cursed story? <gasps> About the priest? Yeah, okay, cool. Jared found some stuff. The good one. All right. So, screw these other ghost stories. I don't care about these people from 1999. All right. So, I just gave you one of the, my own personal experience. Yours is great, and we'll do more of yours, but I want to well, hear that this was legend. You, that, that, that was, was your only one? That was basically. That was the only ghost story? Well, had? I heard the, the sounds from the ground. You heard but people I talking or you sort I speculate it's gas. My friends were like, it sounds like people speaking. And I was like, did it, did it, say it sounds leave like this place? gas escaping from the ground. It didn't sound like it to me. It'd be really great if it sounded like tormented screams from hell yelling it, to leave this it place. It sounded like gas escaping the ground to me. My friends swear to God they heard voices. I heard gas escaping the ground. But I did see a miner disappear behind a hill. Like that. Well, that was why a- are you bringing children with you on these trips? <laughs> To sacrifice them to the cursed town. Duh. (laughs) Well, there's a legend that tells that Centralia was cursed by the long-deceased priest of St. 
Ignatius Roman Catholic Church. Okay. Father Daniel Ignatius. Wow, what a prick. He named it after himself Daniel and called Ignatius. himself a saint. Saint Ignatius. Yeah, that's weird. McDermott. He had three names. He used his middle name. Uh-uh. I don't like him. The first <laughs> Roman Catholic priest to call Centralia home. I really, oh, wanted, I was, I was like, I really the first to, one ever. I really wanted to hold that there and yeah, screw with maybe you. Maybe he is the Saint Ignatius. <laughs> The He's town. the first Roman Catholic priest? Wow. I don't know anything about religion. <laughs> town founder Alexander Ray had been murdered <gasps> on 17th October 1868. God dang. British. Is that when they did the curse? <laughs> Jared had the same issue the one time. I'm sitting there like, what's the 17th month? And I'm like, none of them. None of them are the 17th <laughs> month. Oh, because they do day, month, year yeah, the way I, that it should be. That's why it sounded so dumb when I said it because I was like, 17 October. And I'm like, that's not. <laughs> it was the 17th October of 1868. It was, it was the 17th October in 1868. <laughs> Because anyway, in Centralia, it's always October. Alexander Ray was murdered while riding in a horse and buggy between Centralia and Mount Carmel. Caramel. Caramel. Carmel. It's Carmel. Mount Carmel. Four miles to the west, suspicion fell on the members of the Molly Maguire's gang. An Irish Catholic hey. secret society that found the coal. One second. <laughs> What are you doing? Uh, Pause. Uh, my girlfriend's freaking out because I didn't answer the phone and she's on her lunch break. Yell at her. Let oh, my God. Let me just call her and tell We're her. We're keeping this. Okay. This is staying in. Okay, bye. Suspicion fell on the members of the Molly Maguires, an Irish Catholic secret society that found the coal barons of the day, that fought the coal barons of the day for the rights of the coal mines. Stupid Irish Catholics. So, wait, wait. There was a Catholic... Mob. Irish Catholics. So Catholic mob. Of Irish people. Yes, back then. It's very specific. Catholic people were Irish, yes. Some of them. Mostly. What about the Romans? What? Romans don't count. What about the Greek? Greeks weren't Catholic. Greek Orthodox? Oh, yeah, I guess that's a thing, huh? (laughs) Anyway, Father McDermott. I don't really know anything about religion. Father McDormand suspecting. <laughs> Why did you go on that rant? <laughs> <laughs> You're just like the Catholics. The like, Catholics. No, specifically it was the, the Catholic. Irish Catholics. Because like everything in Christianity, they're separate too. Okay, let's just get, get through this. Father McDermott suspecting the killers were the members were members of his congregation began denouncing the Molly Maguires from the pulpit. On a night in 1869, a group of men attacked Father McDormand in the church cemetery in retaliation. <laughs> According to the legend, Father McDermott made his way back to the church after being assaulted and rang the church bell to summon the townsfolk, after which he pronounced the curse on the town. According to Father McDermott, a day would come when only St. Ignatius, Ignatius, Ignatius? Saint Ignatius Roman Catholic Church would be left standing Is that what you were trying Australia. to say the first time, Ignatius? Shh. Well, McDermott appears to have been partially right. Although there are eight buildings remaining in Centralia, St. Ignatius, Ignatius Church is one of them. The church has closed in June 1995 and was demolished in 1997 due to the fact that it was directly in the impact zone of the fire, mine fire and posed danger of carbon monoxide Wait, exposure. I thought people were still going to this church. Not this one, apparently. There's another church there. The only And you just said it was still open and then described when it was demolished. The only remaining, the only church remaining in the immediate area is the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Assumption? That's weird. I assume she was a virgin. Is, is so? Is that the one people still go to, or is that the also Ukrainian a... Catholic Church? See, now it's Ukrainian Catholic. Now it's not Irish Catholic, and it's not Roman Catholic. Now it's Ukrainian Catholic. Just outside, how the many Catholic Women's... churches are there? A lot. Limits of the borough, although technically not its Centralian church, many of its former residents were parishioners. Some believe that Father McDermott's prophecy simply foretold the wrong church, further diminishing the accuracy of the story of the fact that Father McDermott <laughs> allegedly rang the sum of this house was not actually installed at St. Ignatius until 1874, two years after he left the parish. He made a curse that will keep the town blah, 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 and only this church will stand. Oh, wait, not this one, the other one. <laughs> What? That's not the one about... It's not even in town! There's another one where they... 
about the whole yeah. burning and hell thing. Anyway. Anyway. Hi, my name is Jim. And then let's go on to the next one. Okay. Now we're going to. Did you guys feel informed? Yes. Because you then forced me to stop informing you. So once again, I'm in a weird place with my notes where it's like, <laughs> do more. Kyle, but do I mean this from the bottom less. of my heart. I like it when you just talk. You read notes awful. I read amazing unless it's like a name like Ignatius. Okay. Then it becomes so, Ignatius. So read the notes and then like use bullet points. Don't use those notes. I meant to have bullet points. Yeah. So I got help with my notes today. No, don't do that anymore. No. I think it went okay. Do it, you think it went okay? It went okay. We had some talking. No, we yeah, it was good, but like you could have interrupted as much as you wanted. I did. And you did, but you did not add to the story. No, I just wanted you to cut out a lot of the numbers. Numbers. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the squonk. You heard me right, folks. Squonk. It is I don't a, think you're reading it right. I think it's a squink. Okay. So it's a cryptid in Pennsylvania. Where's it's, Pennsylvania? It's native to the Hemlock Woods. Wait, real quick, though. Um, in the timeline of America, when was Pennsylvania started? You want to say that again without hitting the mic? How many numbers of states is Pennsylvania from the beginning? Mm, like, like three. Okay. Something like that. It's not New Jersey. <laughs> it's, Pennsylvania is it's not no New, New Jersey. Jersey. It's no New Jersey. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> New Jersey is way gooder. I hate Jersey so much. How can you dare say that you're from there? Yeah, I hate it. We're going to have to go into like the long diatribe that I write. That is a reason for why me and him are like that, but not on the show because people will be offended. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I not have an opinion? No. No, I will. You're from New Jersey. You have to just love it because that's I'm from New from. Jersey. I could tell you for a fact it's full of garbage. It's not. Mostly the people. What about Burlington? Burlington Coat Factory? No, the city. It's really nice. Oh, yeah. There's, look, Jersey has both a really, really wealthy county and really nice areas, and it's also full of a lot of trash people. My mom lives there. And? <laughs> I just wanted to say that. <laughs> okay. My one sister who listens will laugh now. So the squonk was first officially recorded in nine. When? When was it first originally recorded? The squonk was first or- officially recorded in 1910. It was uh, featured in a book with uh, called Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods. Lumberwoods. Um. I don't know Pennsylvania being a lumber state. It's more of a coal state. It is mostly woods. It's mostly slate. It's, yeah, slate under trees. Mostly most of Pennsylvania is clay. And slate and coal and trees. But there's more clay than all those things because the clay is everywhere. Well, the, yeah, there's a lot of clay. <laughs> <laughs> this is just my revenge. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, okay, so the squonk, I'm going to read this very brief description of it by William T. Cox from the Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods. From what year? 1910. 1910. Mm-hmm. The squonk is of a very retiring disposition, generally traveling about at twilight. Wait, though. <laughs> this is a legitimate question. Yeah. What is a retiring disposition? <laughs> I think it is that someone who's just like too old for this shit, just constantly walking around, I, I just being like the squonk's just like, oh, <laughs> oh, my back hurts. That's actually pretty I'm accurate so for how the squonk over is. All of this. That's correct. That's how the squonk is described. <laughs> it's just the squonk is just um, Danny Glover from Lethal it, Weapon. It totally is. The squonk is 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 always always depicted as like miserable, crying. Just useless. So it travels about. Why'd you make eye contact with me when you said that? (laughs) He noticed you did it because I saw him be like. (laughs) (laughs) It was direct eye contact. There was a pause. He just went useless. (laughs) You're not going to be able to cut that out. (laughs) That's in both mics. I heard that from my. (sighs) sorry (laughs) useless so it's (laughs) not um 
Because of its misfitting skin, which is covered with warts and moles, it is always unhappy. Hunters who are good at tracking are able to follow a squonk by its tear-stained trail. Wait a minute. Is this thing just like a really vain creature that it's yeah. only upset because it's ugly? Yeah. So Is there like one squonk that's like, I'm the hot squonk, and like that's the one? That's the one that No, because if it thinks it's the hot get? squonk, it's not a squonk anymore. <laughs> It changes. It turns it into a butterfly. Cocoons. Then it turns into like a goblin or something. I don't know. So it always cries. People track it by tears. It's like, it looks like a, a Sharpay dog, but with uglier skin. Well, they probably saw Sharpays. Of a squonk or of a Sharpay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Show that it's, it's, it's put it it's side by big, side comparison. Big, wrinkly, like layers of skin, but it's all warty. And it was probably like someone that first saw it was probably saw a Sharpe with nah, like, it's mange. just a pug. I mean, it could be a pug. I hate pugs. Maybe that's why they think it's crying. The breathing. <laughs> and it's just the snot that dribbles. Yeah. Out of right. Face. But so that's generally speaking, hunters track it through its tears. And if you catch it or corner it, it supposedly dissolves into tears. And that's it. That's the end of the squonk. I mean, there's a lot more to it. Do you want some specific stories? No, I meant like the dissolves. I do want the stories. I wasn't saying oh, that's the end like, of your story. Oh, you mean like, is is it dead then? Yes. I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> it just cries itself into oblivion. It literally like dissolves into a puddle and then like pops up somewhere else. This is way better than how Sasquatch just walks through interdimensional portals. Yeah, like the, at least the squonk makes sense. It turns to water. <laughs> There's a story about a hunter. Is it so wrinkly just because it's full of water? Like, is it just like a little water it's balloon? It's a water and then you balloon. you pick it up, it just pops? Yeah. That's what it is. And, you know, those coal mine in Pennsylvania's in the hemlock woods, they're gruff hands, so they touch it and it goes, psh. They're like, I love you, ugly pug thing. Psh. Yeah. And then it's like, I need to wash my hands. <laughs> my hands are full of sadness. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! So anyway, so, so one squonk of the stories, is just Pennsylvania's version of Eeyore. I mean, yeah, the squonk is like a weird, like it could. You'd think there were like there'd be origins of it, like maybe they were talking about like diseased possums or like yeah, like some, what like most most cryptids have have like some yeah. some level of like moral story behind it yeah. or like uh whatever keep out of the woods kids well, yeah, that's you, most cryptids have some form of like this will eat you if you go too far from home or like something like that this thing is totally peaceful it will never hurt you it just turns to water if you corner it it's just ugly and cries about being ugly that's its whole story is it's ugly and it's sad about it and then if you catch it it gets so sad it turns to water and there's stories of people catching it Going back to town and opening the bag, and it's just a bag full of water. And then they boil the water, and they make soup with it, and I would do that. And that's how they got warts. No, that's how they got magical powers. I am now going to create a new version of the story that involves people going out and hunting them. Therefore, if they're real, bye. You sad little bitches. <laughs> so what you're saying, you're trying to wipe them off of the planet? Yes, everybody should go catch a squonk, save the water, and make soup out of it. That's... Really messed up. <laughs> but is it? Now, do you have to physically touch it, or is it just if it's caught? So it says different like stories say different things. If I don't touch it, and I just catch it in a pan. I think, so I think it's the squonk's choice. Because some stories say, like, it got cornered, <laughs> and because it was cornered, it went, not today. <laughs> and then some this stories is, say... This is like... <laughs> Like the squonk version of Schindler's List or something. <laughs> what? Wait, Sophie's Choice. That's the movie I'm thinking. It's totally about. different. It is Schindler's List. <laughs> Sophie's Choice is also about Nazis, and I also don't think it fits. No. <sighs> what was I trying to think of? So, and then there's stories of people getting their hands <laughs> on it, and then it's still like this is dissolving. like the Tainos of Jared's culture. What's a Tainos? You don't know what the Tainos are? No, what's a Taino? The Tainos were the natives of Puerto Rico mm. that chose that they were like, yo, screw these Spanish dudes. I bet if we jump off this cliff, we'll become birds. And they all did that. Oh, no. And they didn't become birds. No, they, they didn't become birds. <laughs> and that's why, for the most part, there's no actual like native blood in most Puerto Ricans. Okay, hear me Jared out. Jared loves telling the story. That's why I know so much about it. He talks about it all the time. 
Yeah, I mean, that's they chose, they chose live free or die slavery. hard, I guess. I don't know. But that's what a squonk does. That's a squonk. I don't know if it dies afterwards. Well, it might. The story's you turn into soup. This thing is much more fairy like than some cryptids. Like it's got uh it's does got, it leave pots of gold? Are we a, not sure it's not a that the leprechaun. water isn't full of gold leaf and that maybe it's actually leaving you a gift? Where did you get gold from? <laughs> It's not a leprechaun, you Irish bastard. You're right. This is Pennsylvania. Are you sure it's not leaving flakes of coal in there? It might be. You burn the water. It's actually highly flammable. Highly flammable. This is the most flammable water burn on the, the squonks. planet. I'm going to continue to murder these things. You're just trying to kill squonks Let's go now. squonk hunting. I mean, I kind of want to. They sound really neat. Yeah, but no matter what, they die in the end, whether you're being nice to them or not. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, they'll, they'll just poof or die or choose to die. There's there's a couple stories I found where people were like, oh yeah, I had one and I was petting it and it was fine, and then when you're I went to pick like, it up, you're a pretty boy, you're yeah. a pretty boy, and then when I went to pick it up, it turned to water. Like that's probably because they went, ew, it's sticky, and then they're like, <gasps> <gasps> yeah. <laughs> um, people said that the, the, the some of the stories about touching it were like, if you can surprise it, you can touch it, but then that's how the guy <laughs> caught it in the bag. Like he literally <laughs> surprise. He literally like snuck up on one and threw it in the bag before it could realize what so was what going on. So what kind of areas do they they hide? You said hemlock. It's they're specifically related to the hemlock woods in northern PA, north northwest, north northern. north 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 northwest. It's north. I think northwestern PA. Oh, I'm, I could so be wrong. Far away. It's up there. It's it's out in the middle of nowhere. The hemlock woods are like. Yeah, it's a wilderness. It's it's a real serious wilderness, and it's dangerous. There's a lot of other stuff there. So we need to go here, and we're going to hunt squonks. And worst case scenario, we see a Bigfoot. Um, I'm, I'd, I'd be willing to say we have a better <laughs> chance of catching a vampire Bigfoot than we do of finding a squonk. Why? You think Bigfoot's more realistic than squonks? Bigfoot's out there. So are squonks. I don't know. I hope they are. They sound... Here's why I, I like the squonk. Unlike a lot of other mythos, this is a very specific area. It's a very weird, specific cryptid that clearly has... I mean, there's not anything you wait, can wait, really... Wait, 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 wait. Question. Yeah. All cryptids are mostly in a very specific area, except for Bigfoot. No, there's lots of them that have different relations to other animals around oh, the world. You mean like the Jersey, the Jersey Like the Jersey Devil? Devil Justin the Jersey? Which the Jersey primarily. Devil is probably related to... Other cryptids we heard of. They're supposed to be very similar. What about the Dover Demon? That's <laughs> specifically in Dover. The Dover Demon, the Jersey Devil, Chupacabras, and like six well, others. Well, the Dover Demons probably all share very aliens, similar characteristics. Actually. Just because they have the different names, no, don't the mean the Dover they don't... Demon does not share care. There's a ghost. Nobody else saw that. No, what? Something just flew onto the floor of him over there. Are you fucking around or no? <laughs> like, there's like something yellow on the floor over there, like a little piece of paper. It just like flew over there. Where? By the by the monitor. Real life ghosts happening right now. Nobody else notices it. Oh, the paper that was there? Yeah. That no, that flew there. It wasn't on the floor. <laughs> now it's on the floor. It was on the TV. Oh, okay. Anyway. Ghost. <laughs> Ghost Jeff strikes again. So- I like the story of the squonk. It's a it's a weird little creature. It doesn't, like you said, there's no like moral story to it. It's not like this was made to scare children Maybe or anything. It was like don't make fun of people because they're ugly, or they'll turn into puddles of you, tears. You think that's what that meant? Like <laughs> don't don't make fun of people, the... or they'll kill themselves, and don't everyone you will don't cry. Say that you said it turns into a puddle. That's of tears. kind of a good, interesting. Yeah, but I mean, like, well, puddle that's... of tears doesn't always mean dead. If you but that's have an a ugly metaphor. child and you make fun of the child for being ugly. It kills itself. Oh now you cry. That's You're literally just hanging onto the suicide part. But we said we don't know if it's dead when it turns. Into- maybe oh, it's like true. Alice Mack. It could be. Maybe it just turns to water and then like pops up somewhere else. Just like, <laughs> maybe, maybe they live theoretically in like well springs underneath the ground. Maybe so it's that's like how a they get to and from them. It could. Well, that's why I said this is very fey because it turns into something elemental, like it direct link to water. It's constantly leaving a trail of water. It has rules about it, just like poofing. Rather, it's not like they dig a hole and people can't catch them. It just dis the whole body turns to liquid. It it has all of the the the. So is beats. there a time of year that's best for finding it? Like, does it have to be the rainy season? If you're paying attention when I began speaking, I was just trying to be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're they're sighted all year long around twilight and dusk. So they prefer dark. 
Yeah, it is an ugly Undine. Yeah, What's Jared an said undine? it. Un- undine's another type of uh, like fae. Oh. But it's this like one's like ugly, a land-based water fae. That's it's what like this a, is. It's like an ugly little tiny Bigfoot. What if that's hypothetically water some of these water fae, like Bigfoot. some of these water fae like Undines and stuff, uh, just look ugly and hideous on land because there's not a reflection in the water they can because they a lot of them like sirens well, and stuff well, like that wait, anyway trick wait. you with how ugly they aren't. Even better, maybe it's like reverse pruny fingers. They get out of the water and like they the get blobfish. Pruny. Did you know about the blobfish? They get prunier outside of water. The blobfish are deep sea. Fish. I know so what bobfish picture... are. They look like little little dudes with big ass noses. Yeah, but that's not what they look like yes, when they're they do. yeah when you when they're out of deep pressure. In pressure, they look like normal fish, but because their bodies are meant for deep sea pressure, when they're in pressure, they look like normal fish. When they come out, they expand, which is why people have these pictures of them looking hideous because whoa, whoa, they're whoa, up in non the lower atmosphere. What blobfish do on land is what happens to people when we go out of space without spacesuits on. I mean, sort of. Not we. We're more structurally sound, I think. But in to some degree, no, yeah. we get torn apart completely. But still, I mean, to, to some degree, yeah, like that's that's kind of the same process. It's just a difference of atmospheres as far as pressure goes. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so that's why the blobfish look like that. So maybe the squonk looks like you know a, a sweet little water rat or something. <laughs> And then you get it out of the water, and it it expands, and it gets dry because it's not in water, and it's skin all. Oh, yeah, and it's it's shedding water because it's... It's not crying because it feels ugly. It's just like, I need water. Or reverse that. Maybe it's more like a sponge. Maybe in water, it's big and more like a round seal. And then outside water, it starts to shrivel, and that's why you get the extra flaps and the, the moles and stuff, and it's constantly crying because it's shedding water like a sponge. Yeah. That's what it is. So that's the squonk. That's I think we figured it out. And then when you squish it, you spring out well, the rest it. of the they water, and then it turns it into squishes. a rock. Yeah, that's it turns into it like is. dust little, or something. Little rock. Thing. Yeah, I think we figured out the squonk. We did. Now we need to go catch them and turn them into soup. You really want to eat one? I do. Right. I wanted to eat blobfish when I first found out about them. That uh, that's gross. Why? They're gross looking. They're gross looking, but I figure everything's meat. Yes. Everything's meat. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Dark hey, Rum Podcast. shut the fuck up. I'm not done talking. Oh, Jesus. All right, let's go back to Bigfoot's. All right, so Bigfoot has big feet. Have you heard about the stairs in the woods? Thank you for joining us on Dark Rum Podcast. <laughs> if you have other stories, if you've been to Centralia, please DM us at Dark Rum Podcast on Instagram or the Dark Rum. Wait, is it Dark Rum? <laughs> at Dark Rum. Wait, wait. What are you talking about? If they have stories about Centralia, how do they contact us? Darkroomstories at gmail.com. Thank you. Darkroomstories. I turned my mic off, which just helped because I meant to be. I think he saw because I'm like, (laughs) I went to continue. If you've had any ghost stories or maybe you've seen a squonk or you've been to Centralia, anything like that, any thoughts, message us at darkroomstories. Right. Darkroomstories at gmail.com. Darkroomstories at gmail.com. Or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram at darkroompodcast. Um, that was weirdly well timed. Yeah, we're awesome. I'm, I'm so good. I'm Turtle. I'm, um, I said this my is name my partner Kyle. He's a special boy, and uh, thank you for joining us. Have an amazing day. Uh, stay weird.